Chapter 31, Chest and Abdominal Trauma. Let's do a review of the uh, abdominal and chest cavities here and see what's there we're going to deal with. Chest cavity extends from the collarbones all the way to the diaphragm. Because the diaphragm is in motion, the chest cavity expands and contracts as needed. Depends on the respiratory cycle. It's packed with organs, major blood vessels, lung tissue, all kinds of things that could be very serious if we injure them. You have 12 sets of ribs, the sternum, the thoracic, spinal vertebrae, and the scapula give you a nice little cage around all your organs, gives you good protection while still giving the flexibility to expand and contract the chest. Physiological functions of the chest, we got the heartbeat. That keeps the blood flow, and we have large blood vessels that go in and out of the heart, moving blood around, and we have the lungs. So some critical body functions here. Mechanism of breathing, we've talked about that multiple times. You change the pressure of the cavity of the chest, air moves in and out. You decrease the size of the chest, it increases the pressure, air goes out. You increase the size of the chest, the pressure decreases interior, and the air sucked in. So inhalation is an active process that uses negative pressure to draw air in. Definition of exhalation is a passive process that uses positive pressure to push air out of the lungs. So as the body relaxes the muscles, the chest goes back to a normal resting state size, which is increasing. You can have forceful exhalation. You can blow out your birthday candles, but you don't have to. You will automatically exhale without any other effort. That's why we can do artificial ventilations, where we breathe air into a patient, but we don't have to push the air back out. It naturally comes out. The belly, the top border, is the diaphragm. So that's our dividing between the chest and the belly. Abdominal organs go down into the pelvis. So we have four quadrants in the abdominal cavity. They go all the way from the interior of the pelvis to just below the ribs. So we see here we've got our solid organs, the spleen, the liver, the pancreas, the kidneys, all very blood rich and very uh, easy to rupture and cause severe bleeding. Then we have the hollow organs, the stomach, the gallbladder, the duodenum, the large intestine, small intestine, bladder, all containing fluids that when are outside of those containers can wreak havoc inside the abdominal cavity. So we've got two potential issues. We've got bleeding and we've got uh, foreign substances floating around the abdominal cavity. So lots of potential danger here. We're going to use our knowledge of the abdominal cavity and the, the, abdominal, the anatomy structures within the cavity to kind of figure out what's going on with what our injuries are. We know where our hollow organs are. We know where the uh, solid organs are. If we have a upper abdominal cavity injury, that's where most of your solid organs are. They don't tolerate the trauma very well. They fracture or they break and they cause severe bleeding. Hollow organs, as long as it's not a rapid decompression or rapid compression injury, like a blast, then uh, they tolerate trauma pretty well. But if you have a uh, rapid change of pressures from a blast, they can actually rupture too. So we're going to look at the uh, the functions of the different organs based on where they are and what they're what's going on. We're looking at uh, where things are. Maybe it was on the inhalation where the organs were pressed a little bit lower. Maybe an exhalation when they were higher. So we got to be aware of that when the injury occurs. Uh, how much blood is being lost based on how much fluid is going through the body or through the abdominal cavity? Things we're concerned with about uh, injuries to the chest and belly, disruption of breathing. We can mess up the structures of the lungs, the structures of the chest wall, or we could cause severe bleeding in the gut, in the belly, uh, so that the diaphragm can't expand as much as possible. Uh, we could have a disruption of the uh, organ functions. We can have infection. We've got lots of possibility of uh, pathophysiology in the chest and belly.
Let's start talking about some chest injuries. Blunt force trauma, you have fractured ribs, sternum, costal ribs, the cartilages. You have lots of damage there. The problem is underneath you have other organs that could be damaged by these fractures. Penetrating trauma, knives, bullets, glass, steel rods, pipes, other objects. Uh, you got to be aware of what's going on there and uh, know that there's potential damage underneath and where the organs are that could be damaged. Compression or shearing injuries, rapid deceleration. When we talk about rapid deceleration, if a person is in a car going 60 miles an hour and the car comes to a rapid stop by hitting the bridge embutment, the body is still driving 60 miles an hour even though the car is stopped. The body stops and the organs inside are still going 60 miles an hour. So they have to come to a stop. If the heart is free floating in the chest, it is going 60 miles an hour when it comes to a sudden stop and that can cause damage to the aorta and vena cava as that tears apart because the blood vessels are more connected to the uh, the ribs than the heart is. So we, we've got some concerns there with uh, the shearing forces involved. We also, uh, just like our soft tissue, classify these as open and closed. Closed chest injuries can be just as bad as open chest injuries. Rib fractures. They are not painful, but they can cause severe bleeding. They can be uh, difficulty breathing. If It's hard to take a breath when you've got a fractured rib. Now, if you have two or more ribs broken in two or more places, that leaves an unstable portion of the uh, chest wall. Makes it hard to breathe and hard to get a deep breath. What's going to happen is called paradoxical motion. It's a flail segment that goes opposite in direction. Every time you breathe in, your chest wall naturally expands to call you, help you breathe in, but this is going to breathe out. So it's going to change the direction. So you've got the half slab of ribs there broken off and it's going to move opposite of the normal function. Let's see if our video works here. See they're taking a deep breath. It go the chest wall expands, but that area that they're that you got the the redness on is going the opposite direction of the chest wall. Rib fractures, look for the mechanism. Was it enough to cause damage underneath? Is there pal pain to palpation? Is redness, bruising, tenderness, swelling? Are they having respiratory difficulties? The other thing you're going to find is called self-splitting. They will put their arm up next to their ribs so they don't move. Uh, every time I've broken ribs, I've, I've that's the first thing I did was put my hand on them just because it felt better. So flail chest, look at the mechanism. That's a lot of force to break out a, a small portion of the ribs there. Be aware that you're going to have difficulty breathing and they're not going to get a full breath. So they're probably going to be hypoxic. They likely have shock because of uh, the obstructive uh, damage it's causing. When they have rib fractures, call ALS. There is a potential they're going to have a tension pneumothorax so you're going to want to be have ALS there so they can resolve that issue if needed if they do not have spinal injury potential set them upright much easier to breathe have them hold something against their chest put a pillow on them if you have the flail segment take some tape and put across the flail segment. That'll keep it from expanding outward when you're inhaling. Do the standard oxygen, treat the ABCs, 
we used to take a sandbag and put over the flail chest so it wouldn't expand, and we noticed that it kept the whole chest from expanding because they had a bag of sand on their chest. Didn't help with ventilations. So now just use a piece of tape, uh, two inch medical tape, just across it multiple times. That will solve the problem for you. Request ALS. Do not restrict chest wall movement. Uh, the tape just across where the fracture is, just to keep it from moving. Penetrating chest wall injuries. Assume they're all life threatening. We don't want to get to the hospital and find out we made a mistake and it really was. So we're going to treat them all as potentially life threatening because of all the potential organs that could be damaged inside. Um, if there's an open wound, we're going to cover it. If it's a air, air sucking in, we can hear the air bubbling through it. We're going to put the occlusive dressing over it. Find out what penetrated the chest. If you're not sure what kind of gun it was, ask the law enforcement on scene. They're usually pretty good about it. Uh, if look for uh, multiple wounds, entrance, entrance wounds, exit wounds. When you are documenting those, do not describe those as entrance or exit. You got a little wound and a big wound. If you start describing the wounds as entrance and exits and it goes to court, they're going to ask you what your pathology background is. And because you made a diagnostic uh, determination on that, and we don't want to get there. So uh, chest gets uh, stripped down. You listen to the lung sounds. Are they equal both sides? If not, what do you hear? Difficulty breathing, diff uh, unequal lung sounds, coughing up blood, or hypo uh, hypoxia. Other signs you're going to have shock, tachycardia, tachypnea, pale skin, low blood pressure. They're showing signs of shock because they can't take a deep breath. The sucking chest wound, you see the bubbles in it, you hear the sucking noise, um, people gasping for air. What's happening is the, the wound is uh, sucking air into the chest cavity and not into the lung tissue itself. So it's filling up that cavity and it's gonna cause a problem here in a minute. Uh, get law enforcement involved if there's a reason there was a penetrating wound to the chest. Seal the wound with an occlusive dressing. That's the one we talked about in the last chapter. Get them in the position of comfort, lots of oxygen and immediate transport. The CPAP is contraindicated for these patients because they do not have intact chest wall. So, um, occlusive dressings with a flutter valve. As the patient inhales, tape it over. If you're not sure, just tape it over. Leave a corner free so that as they exhale and the air tries to come out, it can. But when they inhale and it tries to suck into the pleural cavity, it won't go in. So you're creating a flutter valve over it. Looks like this. You leave the little corner open and air goes in, or air comes out, but when they inhale, it blocks the air, so it won't go in. There's the air going out. Some of the injuries we're going to talk about for our chest cavity are pneumothorax, intention pneumothorax, hemothorax, and hemopneumothorax, traumatic asphyxia, cardiac tamponade, and aortic injuries. So the the Thorax, pneumothoraxes, and tension pneumothoraxes. The pneumothorax is where air gets in that chest cavity outside of the lung tissue between the pleural spaces, or in the pleural space there, and fills up that cavity and keeps the lung from expanding completely. A tension pneumothorax is where you get so much air in that cavity that it puts pressure on the heart and lungs and pushes them up against the other lung. In our primary assessment, where we're looking for tracheal deviation, that is what is this is indicating, that you've pushed everything to the side because of the tension pneumothorax on one side pushing it to the other. So in this one, this is a simple pneumothorax where the air is going into the chest cavity, but not into the lung tissue. They typically have decreased lung sounds. Jugular veins may be distended. And like we said, the trachea may shift to one side. It's a late sign, but it's one th something that tells us there's a problem.
Hemothorax is similar, but it's blood. Uh, it just it's filling up the cavity. Hemothorax or hemonumo is it's blood and air mixed together. So this is the pneumothorax, where air is just filling up that void, or a hemothorax where it fills up the void, or a hemonumothorax where it does both. Traumatic asphyxia is a sudden compression of the chest. So you've got a, a, a squishing of the chest, pushes the blood out of the organs and the, the blood vessels, out of the heart, out of the uh, center of the chest. Because the head and face are close by, you will get that uh, backed up blood. You'll get the venous blood back into the neck and head. So everything's going to look darker. You'll have petechiae. The neck veins will bleed bulging out the eyes are bulging out and they're cyanotic from the nipple line up so it's a really obvious thing when you see it uh, you will you'll be able to identify it based on the mechanism and the reaction patient cardiac tamponade is when there's been some type of leakage of fluid into the pericardium the sac around the heart because the heart is uh, the, the pericardium is a fiber sac, and it doesn't expand and contract. The more it fills with blood, the less the heart can expand and contract. It's putting pressure on the outside of the heart and squeezing it. This will The biggest thing you'll have on this one is a mechanism that could be causing it. And the other thing you're going to have is a narrowing pulse pressure. So the blood pressure, the pulse pressure is the difference between the diastolic and systolic. So you have a systolic of 80 and a diastolic of 76. So you don't have that expanding, contracting as normal. It'll be a real close number there for you. Blood backs up into the veins, usually penetrating trauma, distended next vein, very narrow pulse pressure. Aortic injury because of that rapid deceleration, you get that uh, tearing, or we have a penetrating trauma that hits the aorta. Not a very uh, good chance of survival from these injuries because it's so uh, dangerous and such a high volume of blood going through these arteries. But the best you can do is get them to the trauma center. Aortic dissection, it tears away. An aneurysm is where you have that bleeding. Uh, because it blow, uh, blows out. They'll have chest pain, abdominal pain, back pain, differentiating pulse and blood pressures between right and left arms, or legs. Because you've got a disruption of the blood flow out of the aorta, it may be going to one side or the other. Yeah, it may be going to the upper extremities and not the lower extremities, so there's going to be some changes there you'll notice. Commodi cordis. This is a uh, problem that happens when you have a sudden blow to the heart uh, right at the right time on the QT segment of the, uh, the heartbeat. If you ever see the uh, t-shirts they sell for kids to play baseball, they've got the chest protector. Uh, they've got a little extra hard pad right there over the heart. Same thing for hockey or uh, lacrosse. Uh, football players are wearing them now. So what happens is you get that sudden impact of the heart at just the right time, and it can stop the heart, put it into V-fib. Quick, easy defibrillation gets you back, but you have to have defibrillators close by. That's why most hockey rinks now have defibrillators. Uh, Surdy Drink, I know, has uh, used theirs a few times for people that have been hit in the chest and had cardiac arrest from Komodi Cordis. So it's, it, it happens, it's just not frequent. But it's a great marketing tool for all you all the parents that want to protect their kids from it. Uh, everybody has to have the t-shirt and look like the uh, everybody else and get that protection. Assessing the pneumothorax, you're going to look for respiratory difficulty. They have air inside that pleural cavity, so they can't take a breath, deep breath. You'll have unequal chest wall movement. They, you won't hear as much lung sounds on one side. That's all clues there's that pneumothorax.
when we get to the tension pneumothorax, you're going to have increased difficulty breathing, s signs of shock. Your dis neck veins will just be distended because they can't push the blood back through the heart. And that's where you start to see the tracheal deviation. Uh, hemothorax, you'll have the same symptoms, but they'll have some blood uh, that'll be coughing up because it's seeping into the lung tissue. Traumatic asphyxia is caused by that rapid compression of the chest. What you're going to see is distended neck veins. Uh, everything's blue from the neck up. Uh, lip line up, tongue swollen. Everything's pushed out. Cardiac tamponade, you're going to find distended neck veins, weak pulse, low blood pressure, steadily decreasing pulse pressure. Aortic injuries, you're going to have that uh, um, re pain in the chest of the tearing sensation. Blood pressure, right and left, aren't going to be the same. Pulses, masses, uh, pulsating masses, cardiac arrest, probably. Patient care for the pneumotension pneumothorax, get ALS involved. They have ways to fix the tension pneumothorax if needed. They can put a uh, a needle into the chest and let the air escape from the pleural cavity or even some systems are working with a finger thoracotomy where the paramedics cut a hole in the chest and put their finger in once they uh, get to the hospital they put a chest tube in lots of oxygen and transport in position of comfort injuries with other injuries within the chest cavity Maintain ABCs and transport. You don't know what's going on. There's so many critical functions in the chest that we need to take care of them. All right, let's move on to abdominal injuries. Open or closed. If they're bleeding, we really can't do anything about it unless something's coming out. If it's open and there's organs protruding, that's called an evisceration. That's a bad thing. Uh, here's some intestines hanging out. We do not push them back in. We want to make sure they're protected and maintained as clean as possible. So we have blunt force trauma causing injuries to the uh, belly. You can have an internal visceration where the diaphragm gets ruptured and the organs go up in the chest cavity. Makes it really hard to breathe when you got intestines floating around in the chest cavity. Uh, the other problem we run into is a hollow organ spill things and gets you infection and irritina uh, irritation and peritonitis. So we're going to have pain, cramps, nausea, weakness, thirst, obvious injuries, all signs there's a problem inside the gut. Lacerations of puncture wounds, blunt force trauma, lots of shock potential. Rigid abdomen, coughing blood, distension. The patient doesn't want to move. They want to leave, be in a, a fetal position to take the pressure off their gut. If they have a gunshot wound, just remember it, uh, pay, the gunshot doesn't go through in a straight path. It may hit organs, may hit tissue, may hit bones and bounce around. A lot of your ammunition is made to break away or break apart as it enters the body and causes even more damage. Look for open and closed wounds. Place the patient with the knees flexed. Maybe put a pillow underneath their knees to give them a little flexion there. Nothing by mouth. They're going to go to surgery when you get there. If they have open abdominal wounds that have eviscerations coming out, a sterile moist dressing remember moist for tissue dry for bleeding so you put a moist dressing and then we're going to take some occlusive dressings or clean wrap uh, saran wrap something like that and put over the top to try to keep the heat in do not remove impaled objects leave them in place try to keep everybody nice and still to get them to the hospital so as with everything, if you've got a question, bring it to class, bring it up, let's have a discussion, hit the like and subscribe buttons, and uh, make sure we get some credit and you get some uh, 
notice when we post more of these. So thanks and have a great night.